Is it time to buy Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway for huge future gains? Now, they did just report their earnings yesterday, so we are going to do a deep dive of how strong the earnings was. We're also going to take a look at the company's revenue growth year on year, as well as their bottom line net income over the last 10 years. We also want to look at the health of this company, their total cash and short-term investments versus their total debt. And we're also going to look to see whether or not any insiders have been buying or selling shares of this massive company. We're also going to take a look at their metrics, the free cash flow growth, the sales, the ROICs, a lot just to understand the underlining growth of where it will come over the future years. And we are going to take a look and put them through the valuation model we want to get to our intrinsic value of Berkshire Hathaway. We want to get to our acceptable buy price given our investor margin of safety. And we'll also anticipate what is Wall Street forecasting for this company over the next 12 months. On top of that, we will also take a look at three different growth rates, forward looking a low, medium and high. So you can also understand where the numbers are coming from and whether or not you also agree with some of these targets. Now, before we even jump into the analysis, the first thing we want to do is just explain the composition of Berkshire Hathaway. So you start off with the publicly listed companies. For example, we see Apple currently makes around 50% of the portfolio. Now, we are going to take a look at some movements as from his essential earnings yesterday. They did, in fact, trim slightly their Apple position. But we can see their largest position still after the trim is Apple. We know their average buy price around $39.59. Their second largest, we see Bank of America, also American Express, and Coca-Cola and Chevron make up the top five. We do know, in fact, every single position he has, he is in the green, other than Kraft Heinz Co. in the top 10, which actually he did buy for around $78, down around 53% from that position. Now, on top of this, this isn't the only thing that makes up Berkshire Hathaway. We also have the companies which is wholly owned by this company, other than Berkshire Hathaway Energy, as we can see, around 91% ownership. So we have the insurance companies, as we can note here, the utilities and the energies. We also see the railroad BNSF Railway. We have the manufacturing, the service and retailing. This is quite important so you understand when you're investing in Berkshire Hathaway, it isn't just those holy or in fact those ones that are talked about everywhere, the likes of Apple, Chevron, American Express, but also a fair amount here of those companies which are wholly owned. And it'll be important because when we do take a look at the earnings, we will see a lot of these have performed very strongly. Now, before we deep dive into the earnings, just want to point out we have a mixture of analyst ratings. We have a strong buy by Quant, a buy by Wall Street, and they hold by Seeking Alpha. We're also going to take a look at how their performance has compared, not just competitors, but also versus the S&P 500 shortly. Over the last year, they are up 24%. When we extend this to over the last 10 years, we can see up 215%. Now, the one thing to point out with this company is they do not pay dividends, even though a lot of companies they do hold, for example, Apple does pay dividends, the company itself doesn't pay it out to shareholders and they do accumulate that. And we'll look at their cash balance soon. P on a forward bait, just under 21, 20.68, which is slightly lower than the S&P 500. That does currently sit around 21.5. So let's jump into the earnings before anything else. And as we can see, the headline reads that their earnings soars 39% as Buffett's cash hoard swells to a record 188 billion. As we were looking at the balance sheet, they do hold a significant amount of cash. They are pretty much hoarding a lot and they anticipate by the end of this year, they will have around 200 billion in cash. Now, when we take a look at some of the reasons why, the key points to note here is that a lot of this earnings growth has been driven from the company's wholly owned businesses that we did just touch upon. And they have, in fact, increased to 11.22 billion from the year earlier. Let's take a very quick look then at some of these numbers. And what we note here is one of the major reasons for this gain, it was led by a 185% year-on-year increase in the insurance underwriting earnings, 2.6 billion they reported from 911 million for the same quarter last year. We can also see Geico earnings as well, insurance investment. So they do have a lot of wholly invested businesses in different sectors that we did just go through. And on top of that, as we just mentioned, they do have a record high now for them of 189 billion in cash 
Obviously, a lot of this will be in short term investments, so they are acquiring nice interest rate on top of these numbers. We also like to see that they did do a lot of share buybacks, 2.6 billion in the stock, up from 2.2 billion from the same quarter last year. So what is interesting to note is that they are doing a lot of share buybacks continually and consistently, which is what we love to see as investors, returning the excess cash. One thing, though, that did get a lot of press notice is that they did trim their Apple position by 13%. However, and as we did look at, even now by some margin, it is still their largest stock holding. So let's jump into the actual numbers, their top line revenue growth, as well as their bottom line net income. And we're always going to start off from 10 years ago. So they reported 191 billion on their top line. And what we note is it has nearly doubled over the last 10 years, 365 billion December 2023. And for the large part, we do note the consistent increases year on year. Yes, some years a little bit more inconsistent than others, but over the longer term, their top line revenue nearly doubled and is moving in the right direction. Now, when we compare this to their bottom line net income, we do want to see a very similar scenario. What in fact we note, it has nearly increased five times just under 20 billion of net income in 2014. And we can see December 2023, their latest annual report, 96.2 billion. So lots of growth. We would also note that on the bottom line, very similar to the top line, there are some inconsistencies, but over the longer term, it is moving in the right direction. And we do want to point out that in our previous video, we did discuss this position here, the net loss, in fact, of 2022, 23 billion. That was due to a write off on one of their investments. But if you did strip that out, it would continue to show a very large net income, pretty much in line with 2021. So all looking good in terms of their numbers on the top line as well as bottom line, something you would expect from a company, as we can see, that is operated by Warren Buffett. In terms of the balance sheet, total cash versus total debt, well, we did mention their cash position, 61 billion in 2014. And as we just mentioned now, a record 189 million. This number hasn't updated quite yet, but we can see over the longer term, they are just hoarding that cash year on year, quarter on quarter, and I'm sure they are getting a very nice interest rate as well. A lot of that essentially being put, as we can see here, from the balance in short term investment. So whether or not they don't see any opportunities right now, which is what we got from the notes of the meeting, they are waiting for a very strong opportunity before deploying a lot of that cash. When we take a look at their total debt in comparison, numerically and directionally, something we love to look at, we can see it has also increased 80 billion in December 2014, 134 from the latest quarterly report. So it is lower than their cash balance, but still a fairly high amount. Similar to their total cash, we also see it increase over the longer term, something we will analyze as part of our financial metrics. Now, we will take a very quick look at their earnings per share consensus versus analyst estimates. And what we, in fact, note the blue, which is essentially the actuals, does outperform the consensus, which is on the left side. And we can see they have beaten over the last four quarters, which is a very good track record. So they do continually beat. And we note over the next few year on year, they are expected to increase 4%, 4 and then 25 we do see a negative 5% year on year. This is projecting the fourth quarter out from now, but we can have an updated look over the next few quarters to see whether or not this is still to be anticipated. So looking good, they do have a good track record of beating the earnings from what analysts do target. When we take a look at some of these metrics that we typically look for other companies, bear in mind, not a lot of them will be available as it is a different type of business to other ones that we analyze typically on the channel. Valuation grade, they get a C plus. Now, this is comparison to the sector median. A little bit difficult with this company. It isn't the likes of, say, Visa, where you can compare it to MasterCard. It is one that you would have to essentially compare to a very similar high quality option. Nonetheless, the information is there. We won't go into too much detail as we do believe this valuation rate to be a little redundant, but you can see this information if you want to come to your own conclusion or put it into your own investment thesis. We then move on to the growth grade. Again, there aren't too much due to the fact of comparing it to those of a high quality company, but they get a B. Now, when we look at it on a purely year on year growth, we do note 21% increase looking very solid, just an isolation. If you do want to compare it to the sector median, a lot better than the 4%. Forward looking, still high single digit growth, 8.06%. Sector median around 5, looking very healthy. We then finally bring it to the profitability grade. Again, A+, plus, so the highest score obtainable, looking very healthy. On a gross profit margin, 34%, sector median, 59 And when we look at the net income, which again is something we do typically like to see as this part of evaluation, 
26, slightly higher than the sector median. Whether or not you want to include any of this information in your own investment thesis or margin of safety, the information is there. Similarly, we do look on Seeking Alpha, which is a website that we use for this analysis. Again, if you do want to use this software, there is a 20% off in the link below. We have similar companies. Now, not a lot of them are that similar. We do have Compass Diversified and Cane Holdings as multi-sector holdings, but they've also included here Visa and Mastercard. We can just include that just in case you were interested to see how they performed versus those two big companies. So over the last year, total return, Berkshire Hathaway, BRK.B up 24%. We do see it up there with the majority of the other ones, in fact, better performing than Visa and MasterCard. When we look over the last five years, we do know up 83%. Again, pretty much in line with MasterCard, slightly better than Visa. And when we look over the last 10 years, 214.8%, lower than both Visa and MasterCard. In fact, one of the lower performers. But again, different investors will invest in different companies for different reasons. A lot of people do like to invest in Berkshire Hathaway, similar to an ETF. They would rather give their money to Warren Buffett and the team to manage than putting it into others like the Vo or other comparable products. So one thing I did want to point out is how does the performance compare to the S&P? As I just mentioned, is it better to invest in Vo, which just trails the S&P 500? Or is it better to put your money into Berkshire Hathaway, BRK.B? Well, year to date, we do note that Berkshire Hathaway is performing or outperforming 12.4% to the S&P 7.5. When we look over the last year, we do see not too dissimilar, 24% versus 25%. When we extend it to the last five years, we do see Berkshire Hathaway again marginally outperform the S&P 500. And when we look over the last 10 years, we do see Berkshire Hathaway 214.8 versus 172.97. So it has outperformed over the longer term. We have looked at just 10 years. But as always, past performance isn't going to be an indicator of the future performance. So whether or not it will continue to outperform, I would be interested to hear your thoughts. Do you prefer to invest in an ETF or do you actually prefer to put your money into Berkshire Hathaway? Now, we can have a very quick look at insider buying, insider selling. Insider ownership does sit around 6.85%. We do note around 2.6 million worth of sales by one insider, but do note this is over the last three years, given the fact that we haven't seen anything recent and fairly similar selling, or in fact, I should say buying 2.4, selling 2.6, fairly similar over the last three years. But over the more recent period, as we can see, we'd have to go back all the way to Q4 of 2022 to see insider selling, Q3 and Q2 to see insider buying. So nothing really to note there. The one thing that we would say is over the last year, as well as the majority of this year that has gone 2024, we do know no insider buying or insider selling. So you could see that as a fairly positive sign. Now, we're going to look at some of these metrics. Before we do, just to let you know, we have released our latest free weekly article. If you want to gain access to this or any others, all completely free, click on the pinned comment below. You can start reading straight away. We just want to draw your attention to this article, How to Find Undervalued Stocks. We run through every single website resource that we use to do our own value research. If you want to take a look, do go look on that article. Again, all completely free. So before we get to the valuation, let's look at some of the underlying metrics. The first one that we will look at is the free cash flow per share. Very important to understand, only invest or analyze companies for your portfolio, in my opinion, those that increase their free cash flow consistently year on year. We know with Berkshire Hathaway, it does move in the right direction. Very positive to note, 10.1 to 14.8, a little bit inconsistent, but nonetheless, it is moving in the right direction. Sales growth, as always, 3 to 7% is the target for steady, mature companies. What we know for Berkshire Hathaway, looking very positive, we know the justifiable year of COVID 2020, the majority of companies in the S&P 500 did drop their top line. Over the more recent period, the last two years looking very strong. Last year, in fact, trailing 12 months at 15%, it is looking very positive. And again, this is purely just another format to what we looked at earlier, nearly doubled their top line over the last 10 years. As we mentioned, shares outstanding. We love it when companies do share buybacks, returning excess cash to investor pockets. What we can see is there has been minimal movement over the last 10 years from 2013 to 2019. But since then, and as we just discussed, over the last few years, they have started to buy back those shares. Very positive sign. But in reality, there aren't that many shares outstanding, as we can clearly see here. ROIC then, return on invested capital. We want 10% or more just to give us faith that management are able to effectively allocate their capital. 
We see over the more recent period, pretty much around that. Now, 2022 will be skewed due to the fact they had to write off that investment. So that would probably be around the same levels from the last few years. So that is good to see, something maybe to keep an eye on. But overall, around the 16% level does look healthy and attractive to investors. Operating margin, we want to see a minimum of 16% and we can pretty much see that over the longer term. That is fairly healthy, trailing 12 months, 33% and the free cash flow margin around 5% as a minimum. And again, pretty consistent, pretty healthy, so no worries there. We then finally move on to the net debt to EBITDA, the earnings before interest tax, depreciation, amortization, showing us the strength of the balance sheet. These are the number of years it would take them to pay off all of their debt net of cash on hand. Pretty much zero over the more recent period. So as we did analyze, their balance sheet does look very strong. No worries. And they're anticipated to be having around 200 billion in cash not too long ago from now. So let's jump into the valuation model. And as always, if you do enjoy the content value being provided, smash that like button, hit that subscribe and bell button so you are continually notified of these videos as they drop. Now the two models we are using today, the first one is Graham's valuation. We have the stock ticker symbol BRK.B. Earnings per share, long-term growth rate, corporate bond triple yield at 5.11. So give us an intrinsic value of 495. As we can see here, a massive undervaluation signal. What we would say with this, in fact, the long-term growth rate was a lot higher. So we have been a lot more conservative. It was sitting around 20 over the next five years. So this is an extremely conservative approach in our opinion. But as always, we never look at any one of these models in isolation and will conclude towards the end. Now, discounted cash flow model, one of my favorite models. We have the free cash flows over the last 10 years. Forward looking, we have gone for 10% pretty much in line with the average over the last 10 years, although marginally lower. We then use the discount rate to get the present value of future free cash flows and terminal value. Add together with the cash, subtract total debt, get to the equity value, divide by shares outstanding, and we get an intrinsic value here showing undervaluation. Now, what we have gone is three different rates. So we have gone for 10% as it is the average. So we've used that as our medium for today. For those who do believe that is a bit too high and want to be more conservative, at an 8% level, we can see it would pretty much say, and while it does in fact say overvaluation, it is essentially what we would say reasonable valuation, a few dollars shy from the current trading price. For those who believe 8% is too low, as we saw 10% is 14% upside and want to go for 12%. That would essentially give an intrinsic value of $528. As we can note here, that would be implied upside of 30%. As always, you can grab a copy of this model by clicking on the pinned comment below. You can run through your own numbers. You can do models for your own companies or those on your watch list. Forward looking though and taking it in, we are going to use the 10% rate, which we see as a medium for today's episode to the intrinsic value calculator. And this essentially for the intrinsic value of Berkshire Hathaway in today's episode is the average of these two models coming to $478. As always, though, current price 405, we do start off with a margin of safety of 10% and we execute if we believe it meets the three golden criteria, a wide moat, strong financial metrics and good forward looking data. If you believe that it is a buy now up to $430, we keep going to this near the current trading price and we see in today's episode around 15% on a margin of safety. Now, in terms of Wall Street and their forecast, well, over the next 12 months, they believe there is around 12% upside. $456 is their target. As always, though, do let us know your thoughts in the comments below. I know a lot of people will be saying that Warren Buffett, how long is he going to be left till he can manage the company? Will the performance of this company be as strong as it has been? Warren himself did say that the days where they were producing very large outstanding gains are long behind them. But as always, when you do compare this, you could argue it is very similar to an ETF. So maybe you want a dollar cost average into this as well as the S&P 500 or other ETFs like SEHD that you do prefer. If you do also want to check out our top five ETFs, we did release a video just a few days ago. But as always, very keen to hear your thoughts. For me, this is one that I could see dollar cost averaging into alongside other ETFs. And right now, it doesn't look like a bad price either. You have to ask yourself, would you rather you play and allocate and manage your money or someone like Warren Buffett and his team who are now sitting on just under 200 billion? As always, let us know your thoughts in the comments below. If you enjoyed today's episode, smash that like button, hit that subscribe and bell button. And as always, we'll see you all on the next one.